I'm Michael Britton from artacademy.com and in this short but free lesson on portrait painting, I'm going to do the great Spanish master Diego Velazquez portrait of Francisco Pescado. It's also known as El Nino de Velazquez or the boy from Velazquez and this was painted in 1638 so it's believed. Now this is going to be quite a small painting. It's only 8 by 10 inches. It took me about, yeah, I think about two hours to do. All in one shot. That's Ella Prima painting wet into wet. But I only used four colors. I used flake white, yellow ochre, Indian red, and fine black. Now if you don't have Indian red, you can use Venetian red, light red, or even burnt sienna. The purpose of using only four colors, especially for beginners, is this gives you a much greater control over your paint mixtures. This allows you to master just a few pigments on your palette, rather than struggling with a huge array of colors, which inevitably will collapse into a heap. Well, enough about me. Let's get cracking. For this small painting, we're going to use only four colors. And that is white, preferably flake white, but that's expensive. Go with a titanium zinc mixture. Next, yellow ochre. That's the mustard color. Next, Indian red, or you can use light red or Venetian red, or even good old-fashioned burnt sienna, and black. I'm using vine black. You can also use ivory black. Technically, black is a blue. So what we have here then is yellow, red, blue. Those are the three primary colors. Now I'm going to mix up a range of hues here. I'm going to begin with my black, add some Indian red to that, Black being blue plus red will give us a violet color. Now, be very, very careful of this Indian red. Don't do what I did and overshoot it. It is extremely powerful. If you're a beginner, well, okay, maybe you want to go with the burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is a little bit more forgiving. Venetian red and Indian red, they pack a wallop. They hit like a heavyweight, knocking over a little old lady. With each value, you want to take a full step. Don't mix them too close together. Don't mix them too far apart. Just do as I do here. Now, I also use a dirty knife. A dirty knife goes a long way towards achieving harmony. Palette management is also critically important. Think of these hues, which are specific color and tone, as keys on a piano. You don't want to be searching for C sharp and B minus. You want them always in the same place. So you don't have to think about it. You want to put all of your attention into the painting. With practice, you'll learn how much to use. The main thing, don't blow out your color. To you blow it out, you got to do it again. As we progress up towards our lights, and lights go cooler as we go higher, it's only in the middle values that our tones are warmer. But I'm not way up there yet. I'm just going to warm this puppy up a bit. Constantly make whatever adjustments you have to. If you need more yellow ochre, go for it. If you need more tint, that's white. Go for it. The practice of mixing flesh tones invokes hue plus tone, that's adding its complement, plus tint, that's adding white, and shade, that's adding black. So what we're looking for is a concordance of flesh tones that are a full step apart on our palette that range from dark to light and warm to cool. But you can see here 
how I've laid out all of my hues from dark to light. Now I'm left-handed so I tend to go from right to left. And now it's time to mix up my final light value. And So this is just yellow ochre and white and I'm always using my knife to mix. Don't use your brush. It'll wear them out and you cannot get a cohesive mix. To cut the yellow in your light, just add a tiny, tiny molecule of black. Black is a primary compound complement to yellow. That will tone it down. Take out that hepatitis look to it. This is a small canvas. By canvas, I mean the pictorial surface, not necessarily the material of the support. It's 8 by 10 inches. I've cropped it a bit so it's going to look a bit skewed. This is just for the presentation. Just like Velazquez, I paint with the brush. And I'm just using my darkest value to strike the arabesque. The arabesque is a term I use to refer to the whole outside shape of the head. You can use contour, you can use mapping, you can use the big shape. I prefer arabesque. Terminology implies intent and arabesque infers a sense of rhythm. That's why I prefer to use it. I sketch in very loosely. I am not one to begin with a highly resolved drawing. I used to. But the problem there is you will quickly fall into an illustrative approach rather than that of painting. Illustrative is much too like painting like a little old lady. Many, many apologies to little old ladies. But what I mean by that and I'll try to extricate myself from any crucifixion here, although I have been asking for it, is you become too timid, too worried about the little stuff. The number one rule in painting is work from general to specific. Go for the big stuff. Go for the big shapes. If you can draw with a pencil or a tiny little brush, you can also draw with a big brush. You can also attack it with energy. Hit it with gusto, a bravura approach. It's only a piece of board. Don't worry about it. It's much better to be off on your drawing but have an underlying sense of dynamic energy coursing through it than a perfectly resolved drawing of a corpse. Alas, I digress. To further resolve my drawing, I'll go back in with a clean brush and just medium. Now, the medium I'm using is just a 50 50 mixture of turp and stand oil and a couple of drops of Venetian turpentine. Venetian turpentine is a tree resin, it smells like eucalyptus. That's an added bonus. With my brush strokes, I endeavor to follow the forms of the head. That lends your brushwork much, much more mileage in achieving a three-dimensional plastic form. Now I'm going to switch into the lights. Because we're working general to specific, you always want to break it down into two parts, the big dark and the big light. However, I'm not going in with my number one, that's the light, light, light value. I'm going in a little slightly darker, my number two value. And again, I'm applying this quite loosely while also directing my brush strokes to follow the underlying forms of the head and all the while further developing my drawing. I'm always keenly aware of the underlying skeletal structures. And it is very, very important. Hmm, the superlatives are really doubling up here. Let me rephrase that. It is very important to understand your anatomy. With the portrait, you must have a clear grasp of the skull. 
Let's get technical here. The facial landmarks that are of the utmost importance are in order. The forehead, this is the frontal eminence. Next is the brow ridge, this is the supra orbital eminence. And as I window shade downwards, I'm now concerned with developing the cheekbones, the zygomatic bone. This defines the lower eye socket. And at the base of the face is that convex muzzle. The maxillary defines the upper denture. And the mandible comprises the jaw and the chin. Those are our major landmarks. Those must be established quickly. Now that I've established my lights, I'm going in with a warmer hue. This is my number five. It's a little bit warmer. My darks will take on a warm quality. And with those, I want to unite my darks to my lights, but not fully. This is Ala Prima. Ala Prima is painting wet into wet. You lay down a stroke and try not to mess with it too much. And as I progress with the painting, I am constantly correcting the drawing. And this is a balancing act. Not only am I correcting, I'm also extrapolating. What are the warm hues juxtaposed to the cool hues to create this concordance of three-dimensional form? In essence, that's what painting is about. It's a juggling act of which we have about five balls to juggle. And if I make a mistake, like in this eyelid, scrape it out. Don't just paint over it. Take your knife and scrape out and remove all of the evidence of your crime. And then go back in with the dark and fix it. No problem. The only problem is seeing where your errors are. But that's a whole different kettle of fish. Velazquez was reputed to be a very slow painter. He painted quite slowly. Now, this may have just been slander. We don't know. Many, many artists were very jealous and bitter about Velazquez. Because, as I said in the intro here, everything came so naturally to him. That son of a bitch. He just never had to really struggle at it. At least not that we know of. Every artist creates their own myths. My agenda is to create energy to it. I want an electrifying current running through the paintings. And you can't fake that. It, you, you just have to approach it with confidence. My painting, right or wrong, is how you want to think. It's, there's a lot of bravado in this method of painting. That's why it's called bravura. But it is the end result that counts. That end result is a sense of life. And all life has a current of energy. That being said, however, an artist cannot hide the fact that they cannot draw. On the other hand, an artist cannot hide the fact that they can draw. Once you've acquired that also critical skill, and that is knowing how to draw, then you can free yourself. You need to put aside this academic approach of drawing accurately, accurately, accurately. Just let it fall by the wayside. It will always be there. But you want to focus on the more important things, and that is the expression and the spirit and also the construct. The construct is the language of painting. And that's why you have to copy master paintings. You have to learn the language. For example, how do we render an eye? Velazquez would do it with just a few very succinct brush strokes. In this painting of El Nino, the dwarf, the eyes are barely touched on 
at all. And minimal of brush strokes. The same too with the lips. You don't want to render it fully. You don't want to bring it up to a hundred percent resolution. It will not fit in to the painting. And you learn how to tackle these elements by studying the past masters. Don't waste the precious years of your career reinventing the wheel. That's nonsensical. When you're painting the hair, fall into hairdresser mode. Just follow the locks. This is a young fella. Young fellas should not have super combed, super styled, slick hair. Let the hair run free. Set it loose in the pasture. Let it romp with all the other hair. Just follow the forms. Just load your brush up with yellow ochre and a touch of red and some tint it shade it or whatever you have to do and whack it in there hold your brush at the end of the handle because that's how they're designed to be held and as I just said whack it in there take no prisoners kill them all you want to paint with an economy of means and that is a true master if you can ascribe an ear with one fell swoop of a warm brush stroke, you got my attention. The same with the nose. If you can get that underplane of the nose in three, nay two brush strokes, well, I will salute you. Anyone can learn to render a facial form by picking at it like a sore scab. Let yourself go loose. Allow yourself to hit that, boom, with one stroke. That's the goal that we're all leaning towards. That is the summit of painting's Mount Everest. Painting is not done by the brush alone. Feel free to use the palette knife. Use your fingers. Sometimes I along with Rembrandt, Velazquez, Franz Halls, Picasso, Stephen Korn, you name it. We'll also use the handle of the brush to crosshatch in, to scrape in paint. This will fuse edges together. And this brings us into the subject of mark making. Mark making is your handwriting. It is the autographical expression of who you are and how you relate to this subject matter. You can cross hatch in finely with a brush handle, or you can doodle it in very loosely, scribbling. That's called graffito, and it's a very beautiful and effective process. Now, to fully pull up my form to get this three-dimensional plastic push and pull of light to dark, I'm now going in with my number one value. And I'm not going to pick at it. You can see I lay down a stroke and, well, I do my damnedest not to fiddle with it. Although, sometimes you got to fiddle. What I find quite effective with my fiddling is to use the knife. Ah, here's another thing. And that is the abstract structural surface. You got that right. Think of the acronym ASS. Oil paint has a materiality to it. It has a physical quality. Exploit that quality. Paint with a sculptural and a tactile sensibility really build up that form build up the patina just as i'm doing here and once again it's always this sense of energy running through the painting that's 
what engages the viewer. And therein lies the power of art. Pay heed to my brush strokes here. I've mentioned this before, but it's very, very important. With each stroke, I am articulating, following that underlying anatomical form. I want to pull it out. I want to create the sense that my subject is breathing, that there's blood and oxygen coursing underneath this flesh. And exuding through this is also that spirit, what we might call the soul, the essence of this human being. Now, it's usually at this stage that my brush stroke is, well, it's flickering around the face like a social butterfly at a cocktail party. It goes here, it goes there. I'm trying to work it all up together, trying to create that wholeness. Now, you've heard this before, and it always bears repeating. The whole must be significantly greater than the sum of its parts. If all you have are exquisitely rendered ears, nose, mouth, eyes, without an underlying spirit, then you got nothing. It's best just to suggest, just indicate, just intimate as something. But if it reads as a concordant whole, then you're creating an engaging piece of work. This is as far as I'm going to take the head. You have to know when to stop. As soon as you feel that the painting is deteriorating, that's when you slam on the brakes. Don't wait until you end up in the ditch. Stop. Walk away from it. Put down your brushes. Go take a nap. Get lunch. Go to a bar. Anything. Just stop your painting. It's not going to get any better. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. You can only go so far as the limits of your abilities on a given day at a specific time. But with each painting, we're constantly pushing back that limitation so we can go further and further. Unlike my studio paintings, with Ella Prima, I kind of wait until I'm near the end before I consider that figure-ground relationship. The figure is the head. The ground is the background. And quite often in my Ella Prima painting, I'll use the ground to further refine and define the outside shape of the head. The background is a complex subject matter. For this demo, I'm going to take the cheap and sleazy route to achieve harmony. And what that means is I'm mixing all of the colors on my palette into one neutral grayish hue. That will automatically harmonize with my head. But that is only a quick consideration. Backgrounds just absolutely drive me nuts. They are, even more than the portrait, one of the most difficult aspects of the painting. Now here's an important caveat. Don't believe everything I say. I am a mess of contradictions. I know, I know, I know. I just said I'm done with the head. And then I went into the background. But once the ground was laid in, I realized, oh, I want to pull the form out. I want to pull the light forms out even further. Most painters fail to achieve the full stretch 
from dark to light. We work in way too narrow a bandwidth. Go for that full stretch. Go for the full enchilada and burrito platter. Just load up your plate. Go the full, the darkest dark to the lightest light. Don't go timid. Rewards are never given out to the timid. It's okay to fall flat on your face. It's okay. Because sooner or later, you're going to pull off a beauty. And sooner or later, you're going to pull off a series of beauties. That's how we grow as artists. It's important as a painter to scare yourself now and then. Go overboard. Do a belly flop into the big blue sea. Having said that, however, there are guidelines. There are, well, general rules of painting. And what I'm concerned with here is both the juxtaposition and concordance and, or harmonizing of cool and warm. Just as with dark and light, cool and warm is an important aspect of painting. However, be careful not to let your cools pop out, nor do you want your warms to get too hot. Everything must be in its proper place. To pump up the reds in the face, like Velazquez, I'm going to render a green cloak or a green coat whatever whatever the hell he's wearing remember black is a blue yellow ochre a yellow yellow and blue make green but in painting you want a beautiful green yellow and black make green that is the cat's pajamas much more authentic much more realist than mixing just a yellow and a, a blue, like ultramarine cobalt. I hope that you enjoyed this short lesson on Velazquez. Be sure to visit my website, artacademy.com.